You're listening to the Dave Sweetmore Show and I've come over to the rehearsal rooms of legendary 60s band The Foremost where the lads are getting ready for a tour with one of the most iconic, influential and recognisable voices, guitarists and songwriters of popular music. From The Searchers, Mike Pender. Mike, how are you doing? I'm fine, Dave. First of all, the first thing I want to ask is obviously during the last year we've had a mad pandemic that's wrote touring and concerts off for a year. In a career that's lasted over six decades, that's got to be the longest you've had off in that <laughs> time. How have you coped? How have you kept busy? Well, I've always got other things to do outside of music, you know, and that's yeah. where I've always been. Uh, I always tell people that, you know, I'm not really steeped in music, only performances. Yeah. If I'm on tour, I, I look forward to going out on stage and singing. Uh, meeting the people afterwards yeah. in the foyer, uh, talking about and meeting up, always meeting up the guys again in, in certain groups, like through the Blue Jeans and for, yeah. Foremost and whoever. Um, but then when, once the show's over, I like to get away and do my own thing. Yeah. And you know, d- during the pandemic, as you say, um, I mean, obviously I've kept my hand in and I've uh, picked the guitar up every other day and gone through a few chords and things like that and yeah. um, sung sung a bit in the kitchen while. My good lady's cooking something, then she throws me out and says, Mike, I'd rather listen to the radio or something like that, you know, yeah. But um, you can always find something. Have you had a nice bit of time off then? Have you enjoyed the year uh, without the constant touring? Yeah, but I only, I only enjoy having so much time off. Yeah. I mean, it's been too long, really. Yeah. Uh, the only good thing that happened, of course, was right at the beginning of the pandemic, I was actually uh, invited down to Buckingham Palace and I got the old uh, MBE, which was very, very nice. I was... I was really overjoyed getting that. Absolutely brilliant. Well, you do get informed yeah. about a month before, and it actually says on the letter, um, please keep this uh, to yourselves. Yeah. Uh, d- don't. And yet, I remember that they'd actually informed quite a few radio stations right. about it. I mean, over the years, when you see other people um, receiving whatever, whether it's a MBA, OBE or whatever, you think, wow, you know, it must be great to, to get something like that. Um, yeah. You know, to be acknowledged for something you've done in your yeah. life, uh, where people have listened to you and said, oh, yeah, you know, I remember the searches, I remember Mike, I remember this. Uh, so it was nice to get something. Uh, when you think that you've never been, the brand's never been inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame in America. Which it should have been. Well, in my maybe, opinion. maybe. I yeah. mean, I, I'm not the person to say we should have been, yeah. but I feel that you know, for the for the amount of, or for the uh, songs that we made successful, uh, you know, three number ones, couple yeah. of number twos, on both sides of the Atlantic. Yeah. Um, I, yeah, they should have thought about it at least, but maybe you know it's never too late. That's it. That's <laughs> it. Do you know what? Let's go back to the beginning. So you grew up in Liverpool. Uh, as growing up, was music always your first passion? What, what were you listening to before you formed the band? Always loved music, yeah. But it was always like country style music, yeah. like um, cowboys. Uh, who was big? Hank Williams and stuff like yeah. that. Um, Farron Young. I remember that name, Farron Young. Yeah. Uh, and I, country western music and cowboys. Yeah, I was cowboy mad as a kid. Every Saturday afternoon, the cinema, favourite cowboys, like, you know. I mean, in those days, it was like stupid names like Hopper and Cassidy and things like that, you know. But cowboys, Western movies, which obviously brings us round to the movie we took the name from. Yeah, of course, I was going to bring it up to the John Wayne film, The Searchers, that's where the name came yeah. from. I wasn't sure whether it was just like a name you liked or whether it was a case of, no, no. we love this, we love music, let's... Well, you know, at the time, when I went to see that movie, I remember coming out of the cinema... Uh, it was on the bus home, and I thought, you know, what a great name for a band. Yeah. And then suddenly, uh, about a month later, I thought, oh no, maybe it's a bit corny, like, you know, the <laughs> searches. Does, does. But when I think back today, yeah, I, I ask people, they say, oh my, what a great name. It's yeah. a great, and it, it's always a word that comes into either um, the news or yeah. you see it in newspapers all the time. Or onto, It's like people were searching for this. Uh, the searches were doing this, meaning obviously... So it's a well-used the, word. Yeah, yeah, it's a well-used word, so it's always in people's minds. So obviously the 1950s comes along, the late 1950s, the searches are formed. The early 1960s, you know, you become one of the most, the biggest bands in the country. You're a massive part of the Merseybeat era, the British invasion. You had all these hit records, you know, Needles and Pins, Don't Throw Your Love Away, Sugar and Spice. 1963, you brought your first album out, Meet the Searchers. You went straight to number one with your first song, which was Sweets For My Sweet. What was it like at that time in your life? Did you realise what you were involved with at that time? It's a question I've been asked many, many times. 
and I thought about it, and so, sometimes you've got a problem trying to think yeah. and put it all together when you think back. Uh, I remember being in the studios. I remember, obviously, we were still working at that time, because when you go in the studios to record your first record, um, I mean, it was a guy called Tony Hatch yeah. with Pie Records, came up to Liverpool. We'd just come back from the Star Club in Hamburg, and he'd, our manager at the time, just a guy in Liverpool, nobody big, yeah. you, you know, he'd, uh, he'd played Tony Hatch, the acetate, today it's an MP3 or something like that, you know, yeah, yeah. Yeah. a little plastic thing, and he played it, <laughs> and Tony Hatch said, yeah, sounds good, yeah. I want to meet the boys, and he was there when we got back. We played Sweets for My Sweet for him in, in the Iron Door Club, and he said, I can remember him saying something like, that's the song. I want you boys to come to London, blah, blah, and, and of course we did. Yeah. Um, and of course, even when we, we recorded that song, and it was being played on uh, Radio Luxembourg or whatever at that time, we were still sort of, we didn't have any, any sort of high hopes or yeah. you know, anything like that. We were going to be famous. We, we were still working, going, doing gigs. and, and You clubs. didn't know what was going to happen. No, we were still driving around doing yeah. gigs and that. And then suddenly, you know, get a telegram. You're at num you've just come in the charts at number 44. I remember, 44. Oh, give us a Coke, you know, have a, have a drink. Because <laughs> you didn't, we didn't drink anything heavy at that time. Yeah. And, um, and then it started. And before you, you, before you knew it, it was number one. You know, first record, number one, brilliant. Couldn't believe it. Um, and Tony Hatch said, I've got your, I've got your follow-up. And I don't know if you've heard the story. He said, a friend of mine's uh, written a song here, it's called Sugar and Spice. Um, and he played it to us. I remember thinking, don't know about that. But of course, we weren't the kind of guys who would say, sorry, we, we're not recording that. We, yeah. we were sort of, I mean, we thought of Tony Hatch as being someone really, uh, so we, we appreciated him yeah. taking an interest in us. So we didn't sort of say it straight away. Uh, anyway, he made it work, we recorded it, and it got to number two. So it, even though today it's not a song that I would go overboard about, yeah. but it was, number, it was number two, so it must have been it must have been good. Loads and loads of hits followed, and, and at that time it was the British Invasion thing, the Mersey Beat thing going on. Did you socialise a lot with the other bands, the likes of the Hollies, the Beatles, the Animals and all that? Did you find yourself in the company a lot, or did, were you very much doing your own thing? Only in appearances on TV. Yeah or Saturday Club Radio, yeah. or um, interview at a sort of uh, big sort of outdoor show, like Wembley or something, and we come in, con in contact with yeah. each other uh, in the dressing room or just before you go on stage. Relaxing and away from the business now, we pretty much kept to ourselves. Um, I always remember John and I would always go home to Liverpool. Yeah. Uh, Chris and Tony would stay in London. They'd made friends, they liked, they more or less, yeah. Um, they'd gone away from the Liverpool thing, but for John and I, the family, it was a family thing. Yeah. We still liked going back. Our girlfriends were still there, and, and, and so we didn't like leaving home too much. Yeah, so it was good to be back in Liverpool when it was? At that time, yeah. The other thing that you were a pioneer of in the 60s, very much so, was the 12-string guitar, and I know you'll correct me now if I'm wrong, but I think the first hit you played that on was when you walked in the room. That's right. What made you pick a 12-string guitar up? Because it wasn't something that was very common on that scene at the time, was it? No. But it was the Beatles and George Harrison. They introduced 12-string guitars, and it was John Lennon, really, who yeah. introduced Rickenbacker. Yeah. I remember at the Star Club, he had a Rickenbacker six-string, of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, it wasn't until Harrison got his 12-string Rickenbacker, and I, I suddenly looked at it, and, and I heard the sound, and I said, yeah, that sounds a bit different, doesn't it? And I thought, that sounds great, on when you walk yeah. in the room. It, 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 that sort of uh, dynamic, sort of two strings you're hitting instead of one, it will give the resonance that you need for that sort of riff. Da -da 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 -da. And so, yeah, that was the first That was the first record. Which has obviously become such a memorable part of them songs as well. Yeah, I mean, you know, that riff is, is instant. You know, it's instantaneous, isn't it? When you when they play 60s records on the radio now, yeah. as soon as you hear that sort of 12 string, you know that that's it when you walk. You know, it's the searches, you know, it's Mike Pender. I think, you know, that's a good point, actually. I've always brought that up in, in, in conversations about having your own sound, yeah. having your own distinctive sound. People could tell it to you. Uh, you know, people say to me, Mike, it's, I heard that record even before the guys introduced it. I yeah. knew it was you because of the harmonies and the, yeah. the 12 string and, and the, the harmonics. So it was good to have your own distinctive sound. Yeah, and the searches certainly did. Do you know at that time you mentioned George uh, Harrison playing the 12 string and stuff? Did you have much to do with the Beatles at that time or had they gone on to another level altogether? Again, 
it was all down to uh, when you'd do a TV or a radio or whatever, you'd come, you'd, you'd meet each other in the dressing room. Hi, guys, how are you doing? Well, they love your record, blah, blah, blah. But outside, no. Not really, no. You carried on being a really active band throughout, and in the late 70s and early 80s, you made some more great music. Uh, you know, you did stuff like uh, Hearts in Her Eyes and Love Melody, which, which are great. You know, searcher songs, you know straight away, the searcher songs. You carried on doing that, you released more great music, you carried on being busy. Then in 1985, uh, you took your own path and formed Mike Bender's Searchers. Was that a massive change in your life or was it something that you felt had been coming for a while? It was a slight change, actually. I could, there were songs that I wanted to do while we were still as the Searchers, even though we'd lost two of the originals yeah. when Chris and Tony left in the 60s. Yeah. Um, but we, we went on a long time with the four guys that we had. We, we still loved sort of that sort of 60s music, but we tended to start listening to American bands, yeah. like the Eagles and Bread and people like that, and we, that was the kind of music that we tried to sort of get into. Yeah. You know, when it came to 1985 and we'd done two albums, I remember Rolling Stone magazine saying, oh, the searchers are back, love their two albums, we're going to hear a lot more of them. But, but it didn't work out, and, yeah. and you know those those two albums. Even though people said the product was good, you know they didn't sell, and so it, yeah. it was nothing. So I felt God, I wasted six weeks at the studio. You've on carried life. on playing some of them songs over the years. We did. I know. I mean, we the did. first time I saw you, we were talking before. I think I was ten or eleven. The first time I saw you, I remember yeah. you doing Hearts in Her Eyes, and I don't think I'd heard it before. Then I was only ten years old, but I remember thinking, what a great song! Do you know what I mean? It's a great searcher sound, and it is. Hearts in Her Eyes was a good song. And even though I say it myself, it should have been a hit. Yeah. And people said to me, Mike, why won't I lie? The only, one of the main reasons I thought it wasn't a hit was that at that time, unlike when we first made it, we didn't have management, yeah. we didn't have a record producer. So you're doing it all on your own type thing. And obviously the new record company are interested and they want to make you. But it's, it's difficult to make a comeback. When you've been so big with number one, number one, number one, great songs like Goodbye My Love, yeah, and stuff, yeah. you know. When you've been through all that and try to reintroduce that sort of feeling and that sound, you're sort of talking about 20 years later and it, it, it doesn't work. Well, it didn't work for us anyway. If, I mean, you know, it, it, sometimes it works, but, but it didn't work for us. You carried on touring, obviously, with Mike Pender's searches. You never stopped until March 2021 when a pandemic made everyone stop with the gigs and stuff like that. Since then, um, I think the whole package tour thing's come back, it? I think package tours have always been with us. I mean, I can remember when I put my own Mike Pender's searches band together in 1985. Yeah. Either 86 or 87, package tours started to come back. Yeah. And, you know, it, they were going out, the searches, during the pacemakers, the hollies, and they were coming back then. They've, they've been with us ever since, really. But the 60s thing was, was in its own bag, really. Yeah. You know, I mean, you had all the other bands coming through um, and they'd play the really big venues. So you always had the big stars playing the big venues. But the 60s bands could still go out and do a tour, but you had to get five or six groups together yeah. to make it work. Yeah. It didn't work anywhere with just one or even two. Yeah. You needed like five or six. And that's more or less what they're still doing to an extent. Although, you know, now we're at a stage whereby some of the guys have passed away now. Mm -hmm. You know, you talk about Wayne Fontana. And, yeah, uh, of course. And the lad from the Fortunes. Yeah. And, you know, Reg Presley from the Trogs. And, and, you know, some of them have passed on. So people are now looking for a lead vocalist who's still yeah. around from those days. And luckily enough, you know, say thank you to, to God every day that I'm still here, that I can still sing. Yeah. And, you know, you've got people like uh, people who promote uh, Sensation 60s. Yeah. They put on a tour every year and we're hoping to start again in October this year. And, you know, with myself and, you know, Swing the Blue Jeans and whoever's still around, they can still put a 60s show on and there's a lot of people still out there want to come and listen to those songs. Well, it's, it's timeless, isn't it? It's, you know, the most important period of music ever. It has been ever. timeless. You know, it has been timeless, it's yeah. It's been great. So you're still doing these tours, like you just mentioned earlier on. Um, early last year, you received, rightly so, an MBE. Uh, you're about to start a tour. You've got the foremost back in you at the moment. And what's it like working with these lads? Well, I've known the lads for a long, long time, um, especially Kevin and Lee. Yeah. I've um, known them for years, actually. Uh, and I've just met uh, the other guys, uh, Matt and... and um, and Derek, they're great musicians, actually, absolutely yeah. brilliant. And they play my, my kind of music. Yeah, yeah. So I can do a, a few new songs with the guys. Um, and although I'm not sort of going to be in the, the foremost, yeah. I can use the guys on a tour. 
or if like we've got a tour of Denmark later in the year hopefully it's going to be on take the guys with me they, and they can back me and they can do their own show yeah. as well uh, they'll go down a storm later sorry not later this year but next year I'm doing a tour in Australia <laughs> and Herman's Hermits are going to back me so wow. yeah so it's it's nice it's a nice feeling to know that you can go, still go around the world as more or less a solo artist yeah but still with the guys that you used to know from the yeah, 60s. Yeah, of course, it's brilliant, isn't it? Absolutely. Do you know what? You've just answered me one of the questions there before I let you get back to rehearsals and stuff. I was going to say, you've got a busy year of tours this year, the sensational 60s tour, Denmark, and I was going to say there's absolutely no signs of you slowing down whatsoever. Slowing down, well, maybe by the end of the set, actually, <laughs> feeling a bit. But, I mean, you know, on sensational 60s, we keep it to half an hour. I mean, some artists could still do an hour and a half on stage. I don't think I could do that because I think yeah. the voice would, would break. Mm -hmm. And so, you, you, when you do get to, I mean, I'm 80 now. I don't feel that old. Hopefully, I don't look that old. Definitely not, no. Well, you know, so you you keep that sort of thing about yourself, yeah. and you you try and think you still think young if you can, and mix with the boys, and and you know try and deliver the vocals as you did years ago. Um, it's never going to be as good, but. As long as people recognise that sort of tone you've still got. Well, you've always had a very recognisable voice and well, guitar style. Well, maybe. Maybe. Thank you for saying that. <laughs> <laughs> it's a fact, um, isn't it? Yeah. And, yeah, you, you do keep trying. And when somebody says to Mike, time to give up, I'll give up. Yeah. Yeah. I can't see that happening anytime soon, though. But Mike Pender, it's been an absolute pleasure. You're a legend and icon of the music scene, and it's been great speaking to you. And good luck for the rest of the year when gigs start again with a tour. And see you soon, yeah? Well, thank you very much. It's been a pleasure. Mike Pender, thank you. Thank you.